fifties, up to naughty nineties, when all life was gay. I knew what love was and I've tasted ecstasy, but I've not been cuddled since the day of the Jubilee. I'm sporty, although well turned forty, and don't need sympathy. Though I'm not a filly, I was queen of Piccadilly in 1893. I beg your pardon. Can you direct me to Hindhead View, Mrs. Allison's? This is Mrs. Allison's. Oh, indeed. Perhaps, uh, may I ask, are you Miss Vivi Warren? Yes. I'm afraid I appear intrusive. My name is Pray. Oh. Oh, Pray, don't disturb yourself. Come in, Mr. Pray. Glad to see you. Very kind of you indeed, Miss Warren. Has your mother arrived? Is she coming? Didn't you expect us? No. Oh, now, goodness me, I hope I've not mistaken the day. That would be just like me, you know. Your mother arranged that she was to come down from London and I was to come over from Horsham to be introduced to you. She did, did she? Hmm. My mother has rather a trick of taking me by surprise. To see how I behave myself when she's not here, I suppose. I fancy I shall take my mother very much by surprise one of these days if she makes arrangements that concern me without consulting me beforehand. Well, she hasn't come. I'm really very sorry. Oh, it's not your fault, Mr. Prade, is it? I'm very glad you've come. You're the only one of my mother's friends I've ever asked her to bring to see me. Oh, now that's really very good of you, Miss Warren. Would you like to come uh, indoors? Would you rather sit out here before? Well, it will be nicer out here, don't you? I'm going to get you a chair. Oh, pray, pray. Allow me. Take care of your fingers. Rather dodgy things, those chairs. Oh, now, do let me take the hard chair. I like hard chairs. So do I. Sit down, Mr. Prade. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, hadn't we better go and meet your mother at the station? Why? She knows the way. Uh, yes, I suppose she does. Do you know, you're just like what I expected. I hope you're disposed to be friends with me. Well, thank you, my dear Miss Warren. Thank you. <laughs> dear me, I'm so glad your mother hasn't spoilt you. How? Well, in making you too conventional. You know, my dear Miss Warren, I'm a born anarchist. I hate authority. It spoils relations between parent and child, even mother and daughter. Now, I was always afraid your mother would strain her authority by making you very conventional. I'm so glad. It's such a relief to find that she hasn't. Oh, have I been behaving unconventionally? Oh, no. Oh, dear, no. At least not uh, conventionally unconventionally, you understand? But it was so charming of you to say that you were disposed to be friends to me. <laughs> you modern young ladies are splendid, perfectly splendid. Hmm? When I was your age, young men and women were afraid of each other. There was no good fellowship, nothing was real. Only gallantry copied out of novels and as vulgar and affected as could be. Only maidenly reserve, gentlemanly chivalry, always saying no when you meant yes. Simple purgatory for shy and sincere souls. Yes, I imagine there must have been a frightful waste of time. Especially women's time. Oh, waste of life, waste of everything. But things are improving. You know, I've been in a positive state of excitement about meeting you ever since your magnificent achievements at Cambridge. A thing unheard of in my day. It was perfectly splendid of you tying with the third wrangler. Just the right place, you know. The first wrangler is always a dreamy, morbid fellow in whom the thing is pushed to the length of a disease. Mm. It doesn't pay. I wouldn't do it again for the same money. The same money? I did it for 50 pounds. 50 pounds? Yes, 50 pounds. I'm... Oh, perhaps you don't know how it was. Well, Mrs. Latham, my tutor at Newnham, had told my mother that I could distinguish myself in the mathematical tripos if I went in for it in earnest. Well, the papers were just full then of Philippa Summers beating the senior wrangler. Well, you remember it, of course. Well, anyhow, she did. And nothing would please my mother but that I should do the same thing. Well, I told her flatly it wasn't worth my while to face the grind because I wasn't going in for teaching. But I offered to try for fourth wrangler or thereabouts for 50 pounds. Well, she closed with me on that after a bit of grumbling and I was better than my bargain. But I wouldn't do it again for the same money. 200 pounds would be nearer the mark. Oh, Lord bless me. It's a very practical way of looking at it. 
Did you expect to find me an unpractical person? But surely, isn't it practical to consider not only the work these honours cost, but also the culture they bring? Culture? My dear Mr. Prey, do you know what the mathematical tripos means? It means grind, grind, grind for six to eight hours a day at mathematics, and nothing but mathematics. I'm supposed to know something about science, but I know nothing but the mathematics it involves. I can make calculations for engineers, electricians, insurance companies and so on, but I know next to nothing about engineering, electricity or insurance. I don't even know arithmetic well. Outside mathematics, lawn tennis, eating, sleeping, cycling and walking, I'm a more ignorant barbarian than any woman could possibly be who hadn't gone in for the tripos. What a wicked, monstrous, rascally system. I knew it. I felt at once that it meant destroying everything that makes womanhood beautiful. Oh, I don't object to it on that score in the least. No, I shall put it to very good account, I assure you. In what way? I shall set up in chambers in the city and work at actuarial calculations and conveyancing. Under cover of that, I'll do some law, with one eye on the stock exchange all the time. I've come down here by myself to read law. Not for a holiday, as my mother imagines. I hate holidays. You make my blood run cold. Are you to have no romance, no beauty in your life? Oh, I don't care for either, I assure you. You can't mean that. Yes, I do. I like working and getting paid for it. And when I'm tired of working, I like a comfortable chair, a cigar, a little whiskey, and a novel with a good detective story in it. I don't believe it. I'm an artist and I can't believe it. I refuse to believe it. It's just that you haven't discovered yet what a wonderful world art can open up to you. Yes, I have. Last May, I spent six weeks in London with Honoria Fraser. Mama thought we were doing a round of sightseeing together, but actually, I was at Honoria's chambers in Chancery Lane, working out at actuarial calculations for her, and helping her as well as a greenhorn could. And in the evenings, we smoked and talked and never thought of going out except for exercise, and I never enjoyed myself more in my life. I cleared up all my expenses and got initiated into the business without a fee into the bargain. But bless my heart and soul, Miss Warren, do you call that discovering art? Oh, wait a bit, that wasn't the beginning. I went up to town on the invitation of some artistic people who lived in Fitzjohn's Avenue. Well, one of the girls was a Newnham chum. And they took me to the National Gallery, the uh -huh. Opera, and to a concert where the band played Beethoven and Wagner all evening. And I wouldn't go through that again for anything you could offer me. Well, I helped out for civility's sake until the third day, and then I said plump out I couldn't stand any more. I went back to Chancery Lane. Now you know the sort of perfectly splendid modern young lady I am. How do you think I'll get on with my mother? Well, I hope you'll... It's not so much what you hope. It's what you believe, I want to know. Well, frankly, I think your mother's going to be a little disappointed. Not from any shortcomings on your part, you know, I don't mean that. But you are so very different from her ideal. Her what? Her ideal. Do you mean her ideal of me? Yes. Well, what on earth is it like? Well, you must have observed, Miss Warren, that people who are dissatisfied with their own bringing up generally believe that the world would be all right if everybody were brought up quite differently. Now... Your mother's life has been... well, I suppose you oh, know... Oh, don't suppose anything, Mr. Praed. I hardly know my mother. Since I was a child, I've lived in England, at school or college, or with people paid to take charge of me. I've been boarded out all my life. My mother's lived in Vienna or Brussels and never let me go to her. I only see her when she visits England for a few days. Oh, I don't complain. It's been very pleasant, because people have been very nice and there's always been plenty of money for things to go smoothly. But don't imagine I know anything about my mother. I know far less than you do. Ah. Well, in that case, uh... <laughs> what nonsense we're talking. <laughs> of course, you and your mother will get on capitally. <laughs> <clears throat> oh. What a charming little place you have here. Rather a violent change of subject, Mr. Prade. Why won't my mother's life bear being talked about? Oh, no, you really mustn't say that. Isn't it natural that I should show a certain delicacy in speaking to my old friend's daughter about her behind her back? <laughs> you and your mother will have plenty of opportunity to talk about it when she comes. No, she won't talk about it either. However, I dare say you have good reasons for telling me nothing. But mark this, Mr. Prade. 
I bet there'll be a battle royal when she hears about my Chancery Lane project. I'm afraid there will. Well, I shall win. Besides, I've no mysteries to keep up, and it seems that she has. I'll use that advantage over her if necessary. Oh, no, no, no. You'll not do such a thing. Then tell me why not. I, I really cannot. I appeal to your good feeling. Besides, you may be too bold. You know, your mother's not to be trifled with when she's angry. Oh, you can't frighten me, Mr. Prade. In that month at Chancery Lane, I had the opportunity of taking the measure of one or two women very like my mother. You may back me to win. But if I hit harder in my ignorance than I need, remember that it was you who refused to enlighten me. Now let's drop the subject. Uh, one word, Miss Warren, I had better tell you. It's very difficult, but... Oh, you're... here they are. How do, Mater? Mr. Prade's been here this half hour waiting for you. Well, if you've been waiting, Fanny, it's your own fault. I thought you'd have the gumption to know I was coming by the 310 train. Still, Vivi, put your hat on, dear. You'll get sunburned. <coughs> oh, I forgot to introduce you. Sir George Crofts. My little Vivi. May I shake hands with a young lady who I've known by reputation very long as the daughter of one of my oldest friends? If you like. I'll go and get a couple of chairs. Well, George, what do you think of her? Well, she has a powerful fist. Did you shake hands with her, Praed? Yes. It'll pass off presently. I hope so. <laughs> oh, allow me. Oh, now, let Sir George help you with the chairs, dear. All right. You'd like some tea, I expect. Oh, I'm dying for a drop to drink. I'll go and do something about it. Oh. Look at him, Praddy. Oh, he looks cheerful, don't he? He's been worrying my life out these three years to have that little girl of mine shown to him, and now that I've done it, he's quite out of countenance. Come on, sit up, George. Take your stick out of your mouth. I think, you know, if you don't mind my saying so, we'd better stop thinking of her as a little girl. You see, she's really distinguished herself. And I'm not sure from what I've seen of her that she's not older than any of us. Well, God, listen to him, George. <laughs> older than any of us. She has been stuffing you nicely with her impertinence. Yes, but young people are particularly sensitive about those sort of things. Yes, and young people have to get all that nonsense taken out of them, and a good deal more besides. Now, don't you interfere, Praddy. I know how to treat my own child as well as you do. What's the matter with him? Well, what's he take it like that for? You're afraid of Praddy. What, me? Afraid of dear old Praddy? <laughs> Fly wouldn't be afraid of him. You're afraid of him. Oh, I'll trouble you to mind your own business, not try and leave your sulks on me. God, I'm not afraid of you, anyhow. If you can't make yourself agreeable, you better go home. Oh, come on, Craddy. You're afraid I'll bully her. You think I'm offended, my dear Kitty? Please don't imagine that, pray don't. But, you know. I sometimes notice things that escape you. And although you've never taken my advice, you sometimes admit afterward that you ought to have taken it. Well, and what do you notice now? Only that Vivi is a grown woman. Pray, Kitty, treat her with every respect. Respect? What, treat my own daughter with respect? No, what next, pray? Mother, will you come to my room before tea? Yes, dearie. <laughs> ah, don't be cross, Freddy. <laughs> I say, prayed. Yes? I want to ask you a rather particular question. Certainly. Did uh, Kitty ever tell you who that girl's father is? Never. But have you any uh, suspicion as to who it might be? None. Look, I know you might feel bound not to tell if she had said anything to you, but uh, it's very awkward to be uncertain about it now that we should be meeting the girl every day. Mm, we don't exactly know how we ought to feel towards her. What difference does that make? We take her on our own merit. What does it matter who our father was? Then you know who he is. I told you just now. No, did you not hear me? Now, look here, Fred. I ask you as a particular favour to me. Now, if you do know... I only say if you know. 
then you might at least set my mind at rest about her. See, the fact is, I, I feel attracted. What do you mean? Well, it's only to be alarmed. It's a perfectly innocent feeling. That's what puzzles me about it. Why, for all I know, I, mean, I might be a father. You? Impossible. You know for certain I'm not? I know no more about it than you, any more than you. Really, No. Out of the question. There's not the least resemblance. Well, as to that, there's no resemblance between her and her mother that I can see. I suppose she's not your daughter, is she? Really, no, Crofts? No, no offence, Bray. No. It's perfectly allowable between two men of the world. Now, listen to me, my dear Crofts. I have nothing to do with that side of Mrs. Warren's life. Never had. She has never spoken to me about it. Of course, I've never spoken to her about it. Your delicacy will tell you that a handsome woman needs some friends about her who are not on that footing with her. The effect of her own beauty would become a torment to her if she were not able to escape from it occasionally. Now, you're probably on much more confidential terms with Kitty than I am. Surely you can ask her the question yourself. Well, I have asked her. Been awfully enough. Well, she's so determined to keep the child to herself. She denied ever had a father if she could. I'm thoroughly uncomfortable about it, Prayed. Well, since you are, at all events, old enough to be her father, I don't mind agreeing that we treat Miss Vivi in a parental way. As a young girl whom we should feel bound to protect and help. What do you say? Well, I'm no older than you, if you come to that. Yes, you are, my dear fellow. You were born old. I was born a boy. I've never been able to feel the assurance of a grown-up man in my life. Daddy, George, he... Well, she's calling us. Here. Living with my people this autumn for the sake of economy. Things came to a crisis in July. Father had to pay my debts. Stony broke in consequence, so am I. What are you up to in these parts? Do you know the people here? Yes. I was spending the afternoon with a Miss Wallace. What, do you know Vivi? Isn't she a jolly girl? Teaching her to shoot with this. So glad she knows you. Well, just the sort of fellow she ought to know. Oh! It's ever so jolly to find you here, Prade. I'm an old friend of her mother. Mrs. Warren brought me over to make her daughter's acquaintance. What, the mother? Is she here too? Yes, inside the tea. Paddy, the tea cake will be cold. Oh, yes, Mrs. Warren, in a moment. I've just met a friend here. A what? A friend. Oh, well, bring him in. All right. Do you wish to accept the invitation? Is that Vivi's mother? Yes. By Jove, what a lark. Do you think she'll like me? I've no doubt you'll make yourself popular, as usual. Come in and try. No, stop a bit. I want to take you into my confidence. Oh, no, please don't. It's only some fresh folly like the barmaid at Red Hill. No, it, no it's, it's ever so much more serious than that. You say you've only just met Vivi for the first time? Yes. Oh, then you can have no idea what a girl she is. Such character, such sense, and her cleverness. Oh, my, I pray, but I can tell you she is clever. And, need I add, she loves me. I say, pray, what are you about? Come along. Hello. Sort of chap would take a prize at a dog show, ain't he? Who is he? Sir George Croft. That old friend of Mrs. Warren. Fred? Hello! Well, it's my father. Yes, Governor, all right, presently. Uh, look, Ruddy, uh, you better go into tea. I'll be with you directly. Very well. Well, sir, who are your friends here, if I may ask? That's all right, come in. No, sir. Not until I know whose garden I'm entering. That's all right. It's Miss Warren's. I've not seen her at church since she came. Oh, of course not. She's a third wrangler. Never so intellectual. She took a higher degree than you did, so why should she come to hear you preach? Don't be disrespectful, oh, sir. I mean, nobody hears us. I want to introduce you to her. Do you remember the advice you gave me last July, Governor? Yes. I advised you to conquer your idleness and flippancy and to work your way into an honourable profession. And live on it, not upon me. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's what you thought of afterwards. What you actually said was that since I had neither brains nor money, I'd better turn my good looks to account by marrying somebody with both. Well, Miss Warren has brains, you can't deny that. Brains are not everything. Well, no, of course not. There's the money. I was not thinking of money, so I was speaking of higher things. 
Social position, for instance. I don't care a rap about that. But I do, sir. But nobody wants you to marry her. Anyway, she has what amounts to a high Cambridge degree, and she seems to have as much money as she wants. I greatly doubt whether she has as much money as you will want. Oh, come. I haven't been so very extravagant. I live ever so quietly. <laughs> I don't drink and I don't bet much. And I never go regularly on the razzle-dazzle as you did when you were my age. Silence, sir. You told me yourself, when I was making ever such an ass of myself over that barmaid at Red Hill, that you once paid a woman 50 pounds for some Shh, letters you... Frank! For heaven's sake! You are taking an ungentlemanly advantage of what I confided to you for your own good. To save you from an error, you would have repented all your life long. Take warning by your father's folly, sir. Don't make them an excuse for your own. Do you ever hear the story of the Duke of Wellington and his letters? No, sir, and I don't want to hear. Ah, the old Iron Duke, he didn't throw away 50 pounds, not he. He just wrote, Dear Jenny, publish and be damned yours affectionately, Wellington. That's what you should have done. Frank, my boy, when I wrote those letters, I put myself into that woman's power. When I told you about them, I put myself, to some extent, I'm sorry to say, in your power. She refused my money with these words, which I shall never forget. Knowledge is power, she said, and I never sell power. That's more than 20 years ago, and she's never made use of her power or caused me a moment's uneasiness. You, you are behaving worse to me than she did, Frank. I dare say. Did you ever preach at her the way you preach at me every day? I leave you, sir. You're incorrigible. Tell them I shall be home to tea, will you, Governor, like a good fellow? Father, I would like to meet him. Certainly. Governor, you want it? My father, Miss Warren. Glad to see you here, Mr. Gardner. Mother, come. You're wanted. Let me introduce... Why, it's Sam Gardner. And gone into the church. Well, <laughs> I never. But well, don't you know her, Sam? This is George Crofts, large as life, twice as natural. Well, don't you remember me? Really, I, um... Oh, well, of course you do. I have a whole album of your letters still. I came across them only the other day. Miss v v Vavasaw, I believe. T -t -t Nonsense. Mrs. Warren. Well, don't you see my daughter there? Oh, mate, there, dark and fair, so take cheek your eye on. Down to the tiddly of the plantain, pop into the old red liar. Oh, Lord. I don't know which is the worst of the country. The walking or the sitting at home with nothing to do. I could do with a whiskey and soda now very well. If only they had such a thing in this place. Perhaps if has got some. Oh, nonsense. What would a young girl like that be doing with such things? Never mind. Don't matter. I wonder how she passes her time here. <laughs> I'd a good deal rather be in Vienna. Let me take you there. Oh, would you? I'm beginning to think you're the chip of the old block. Like the governor, eh? Well, never you mind. What do you know of such things? You're only a boy. Do come to Vienna with me. We'll be ever such larks. No, thank you. Now, Vienna's no place for you. Well, at least not until you're a little older. Now, see here, little boy. I know you through and through by your likeness to your father and better than you know yourself. So don't go taking any silly ideas into your head about me. You hear? Well, can't help it, my dear Mrs Warren. It runs in the family. Oh. Shouldn't have done that. Mm, I am wicked. Well, never you mind, my dear. It's only a motherly kiss. Go and make love to Vivi. So I have. What? Vivi and I are ever such chums. What do you mean? See here, I won't have any young scam tampering with my little girl. Here, I won't have it. My dear Mrs. Warren, don't you be alarmed. My intentions are honourable, ever so honourable. And your little girl is jolly well able to take care of herself. She don't need looking after half as much as a mother. She ain't so handsome, you know. And you have got a nice, healthy, two inches thicker cheek all over you. 
I don't know where you got it. Oh. Not from your father, anyhow. Ah, remember now, you've had your warning. The gypsies, I believe. Look, whatever became of you two? Well, where's Vivian Praddy? Well, they went up the hill. We went to the village. I wanted a drink. She oughtn't to go off like that without telling me. George, where are you going to stay tonight? Well, you can't stay here. And what's Praddy going to do? Well, Gardner will put me up. No doubt you've taken care of yourself. But what about Braddy? Well, I don't know. I suppose he can stay at the inn. Haven't you room for him, Sam? Well, uh, you see, as rector here, I'm not free to do as I like. Um, what is Mr. Prade's social position? Well, he's all right. He's an architect. <laughs> what an old stick in the mud you are, Sam. Yes, it's all right, Governor. He built that place down in Wales for the Duke. Carnarvon Castle, they call it. You must have heard of it. In that case, of course, we should make you happy. I suppose he knows the Duke personally. Oh, ever so intimately. We can stick him in Georgina's old room. Oh, well, that's settled. Oh. Well, if those two had only come in, let's have supper. You've no right to stay out after dark like this. But what harm are they doing you? Look, harm or not, I don't like it. Better not wait for them, Mrs Warren. Braddy will stay out as long as possible. He's never known before what it is to stray over the heath on a summer night with my Vivi. I say, you know, Clown. Frank, once for all, it's out of the question. Mrs. Warren will tell you it's not to be thought of. Of course not. Is that so, Mrs. Warren? Oh, I don't know, Sam. If the girl wants to get married, no good can come of keeping her unmarried. Married to him? Your daughter to my son? And you think it's impossible? Of course it's impossible. Don't be a fool, Kitty. Well, why not? Isn't my daughter good enough for your son? Surely, my dear Mrs. Warren, you know the reasons. Look, I know no reasons. If you know any, you can tell them to the lad or to the girl or to your congregation, if you like. You know very well that I couldn't tell anyone the reasons. But my boy will believe me when I tell him there are reasons. Mm. Oh, quite right, Daddy, will. But has your boy's conduct ever been influenced by your reasons? You can't marry her, and that's all about it. What have you got to do with it, pray? Precisely what I was going to ask myself in my own graceful fashion. I suppose you don't want to marry the girl to a man younger than herself and without either tuppence or a profession to keep her on? You know, Sam, if you don't believe me, how much more money are you going to give him? Not another penny. He's had his patrimony and he spent the last of it in July. Where? Who told you? Oh, this is ever so mercenary. Do you suppose Miss Warren is going to marry for money? If we love one another, Oh, I... thank you. <laughs> Your love's a pretty cheap commodity, my lad. And if you've no means of keeping a wife, that settles it. You can't have Vivi. What do you say, Governor, eh? I agree with Mrs. Warren. Oh, and good old Crafts has already expected... Now, look here, I want none of your cheek. I'm ever so sorry to surprise you, Crofts. But you allowed yourself the liberty of speaking to me like a father a moment ago. Well, uh, one father's enough, thank you. Yeah. No, Mrs. Warren, I cannot give my Vivi up, even for your sake. Yeah, young scamp. And since you no doubt intend to hold out other prospects to her, I shall lose no time in placing my case before her. He either fears his fate too much, or his deserts are small, but dare not put it to the touch to gain. Oh, Wherever have you been, Vivi? On the hill. Well, you wouldn't to go off like that without letting me know. How could I tell what had become of you? Night coming on, too. Now, about supper. I'm afraid we're going to be rather crowded in here. Did you hear what I said, Vivi? Yes, Mother. Now, how many are we? One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, I'm afraid two will have to wait until the rest are done. Mrs. Allison only has knives and plates before. Oh, please, don't bother about me. You've had a long walk and a hungry, Mr. Prade. You'll have your supper at once. I myself can wait. I want one to wait with me. Frank, are you hungry? Not the least in the world. Completely off my pack, in fact. Good. Neither are you, George. You can wait. Oh, hang it. I've eaten nothing since tea time. Can't sound of it. Would you starve my poor father? Allow me to speak for myself, sir. I am perfectly willing to wait. There's no need. Only two are wanted. Will you take my mother in, Mr. Gardner? Now, Mother, if you'd like to go at the end there. Mr. Gardner, could you go at that corner there? Thank you. Sir George here. Mm, yeah. And could you squeeze past that corner, Mr. Prade? Oh, Rather a tight fit, I'm afraid. Be careful if you coat against the whitewash. That's right. <coughs> now, are we all comfortable? Thank, Thank you, Randy. Good. Leave the door open, mm. dearie. 
Lord, what a draft. Look, you better shut it, dear. Oh, got rid of him. Well, Vivims, what do you think of my governor, eh? I've hardly spoken to him. He doesn't seem to me to be a particularly able man. Oh, you know, the old fellow is not altogether such a fool as he looks. See, he was shoved into the church, rather. And trying to live up to it, he makes himself into a much bigger ass than he really is. I don't dislike him quite as much as you might expect. He means well. How do you think you're going to get on with him? I don't think my future life will be much concerned with him. Or with any of that old circle of my mother's. Except perhaps prayed. What do you think of my mother? Really and truly? Yes, really and truly. Well, <laughs> she's ever so jolly, but she is rather a caution, isn't she? And Crofts. Oh, my eye, Crofts. What a lot, Frank. What a crew. If I thought that I was like that, that I was going to be a waster, shifting along from one meal to another with no purpose, no character, no grit in me, why, I'd open an artery and bleed to death without a moment's hesitation. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Why should they take any grind when they can afford not to? I wish I had their luck. No, what I object to is their form. It isn't a thing. It's slovenly, ever so slovenly. And do you think your form will be any better than Croft's when you're as old as him if you don't work? Of course I do. It'll be ever so much better. Now, Vivums mustn't lecture because her little boy is encouraging. Oh, be off with you. Vivums is in no mood for petting her little boy this evening. Oh, how kind. Oh, be serious. I'm serious. Good. Let's talk learnedly, Miss Warren. Do you know that the most advanced thinkers are agreed that half the diseases of the modern civilization are due to starvation of affection in the young? You're no. very tiresome. Vivi. Have okay. you any room for Frank in there? No, He's don't. complaining of starvation. Of course, course, boy will be I've ever finished. so even with his rhythms for this. Here, baby, come on, you two, child. You must be famished. Really? Yes, I'm so sorry. Never I'm so sorry there wasn't anything. George, you can't be done. You've eaten nothing. Anything wrong with you? All I wanted was a drink. Oh, I like enough to eat. Let me say, look at that cold beef and cheese and lettuce goes a long way. What are you going encouraging that young pup for? I see you, George. What are you up to with that girl? I've been watching your way of looking at her, and you remember I know you and what your looks mean. <laughs> There's no harm in looking at her, is there? Oh, well, I'd put you out. I'd pack you back to London pretty quick if I say any of your nonsense. My girl's little finger's more to me than your whole body and soul. <laughs> you can make your mind easy. Because the young pup has no more chance than you have. Do you mean to man take an interest in the girl? Well, not a man like you. How old is she? She's too... Ah, never you mind how old she is. What do you make such a secret of it for? Because I choose. Well, I'm not 50 yet. And the property's as good as ever it was. Yeah, because you're as stingy as you're vicious. Well, a baronet isn't to be picked up every day. Ah. Well, no other man in my position is going to put up with you for a mother-in-law. Well, why shouldn't you marry me? You. <laughs> well, we three could live together quite comfortably. You know, I'd die before her and leave her a bouncing widow with plenty of money. And why not? It's been growing in my mind ever since I was walking with that damn fool inside there. Oh, just a thing that would grow in your mind. I see here, Kitty. You're a sensible woman. I mean, you needn't put on any moral airs. I'll ask no more questions and you need answer none. I'll settle the whole property on her. And if you need a cheque for yourself on the wedding day, you can name whatever figure you like. Within reason. So it's come to that with you, George. Like all the other worn-out old creatures. <gasps> Damn you. Well, <gasps> oh, dearie. You had a good supper. You know what Mrs. Allison's suppers are? Poor Frank. Was all the beef gone? Did he get nothing but bread and cheese and ginger beer? Her butter's really awful. I must get some down from the stores. Do, in heaven's name. Where's George? Boy, well, we've gone out to have a pipe. Frank, my boy, it's time for us to be thinking of home. Your mother does not know yet that we have visitors. I'm afraid we're giving trouble. Not the least in the world. My mother will be delighted to see you. She's a genuine intellectual artistic woman. And she sees no one here from one year's end to the next, except a governor, so you can imagine how jolly dull it pans out for her. Because you're not intellectual or artistic, are you, Peter? So you take Prade home at once, and I'll stay here and entertain Mrs. Warren. You'll pick up Crofts in the garden. He'll be excellent company for the bull pup. Now, you come along with us, Frank. 
Mrs. Warren hasn't seen Vivian for a long time. We've prevented them from having a moment together yet. Of course. I forgot. Ever so thanks for reminding me, Paddy. Perfect gentleman. Always were. My ideal through life. Oh, if only you'd been my father instead of this unworthy old man. Silence, sir, silence. You're profane. <laughs> you know, you should keep him in better order, sir. Ah, uh, Paddy, give George his hat and stick. With my compliments. Warren. Come along, sir. At once. Yeah, I'm afraid you will. No, I hate you. <laughs> Sorry. Goodbye, dear Mrs. Warren. Did you ever in your life hear anyone rattle on so? Any of teas? Now that I think of it, dearie, don't you go encouraging him. I'm sure, he's a regular. Good for nothing. Yes. Poor Frank. I'll have to get rid of him. But I'll feel sorry for him, although he's not worth it. That man Crofts does not seem to be worth much either, is he? What do you know of men, child, to talk that way of him? You'll have to make up your mind to see a good deal of Sir George Crofts. He's a friend of mine. Why? Will we be much together? You and I, I mean. Oh, of course. Till you're married. You're not going back to college again. And do you think my way of life would suit you? I doubt it. Your way of life? What do you mean? Has it never occurred to you, Mother, that I have my way of life like other people? Well, what nonsense is this you're trying to talk? I want to show your independence now that you're a great little person at school. Oh, <laughs> God, now, don't be a fool, child. That's all you have to say on the subject, is it? Don't you keep on asking me questions like that. Hold your tongue. You and your way of life, indeed. What next? Look, your way of life will be what I please, so it will. I've been noticing these ears and you ever since you got that tripod, or whatever you call them. If you think I'm going to put up with them, you're mistaken. And the sooner you find it out, the better. But all I have to say on the subject, indeed. Do you know who you're speaking to, miss? No. Who are you? What are you? Ah, you young imp. Everybody knows my reputation, my social position, the profession I intend to pursue. I know nothing about you. What is this way of life that you, that you invite me to share with you and Sir George Crofts, Pray. Now, look, you take care. Now, I shall do something I'll be sorry for, and you too. All right. Let's drop the subject until you're better able to cope with it. You need some good walks and a little lawn tennis to set you up. You're shockingly out of condition. You couldn't manage 20 yards uphill today without stopping to pant, and your wrists are mere rolls of fat. Look at mine. Oh, now, please, don't begin to cry. Anything but that. I'll go out of the room if you do. Darling, how can you be so hard on me? Look, have I no rights over you? As your mother? Are you my mother? Am I your mother? Oh, Vivi! Well, where are our relatives? My father, our family friends? You claim the rights of a mother? The right to call me fool and child? To speak to me as no woman in authority at college dare speak to me? To dictate my way of life? To force on me the acquaintance of a brute who anyone can see as the most vicious sort of London man about town? Well, before I give myself the trouble to resist such claims, I may as well find out if they have any real existence. Stop, stop! I am your mother, I swear it! But you don't mean to turn on me. What, my own child? It's, it's not natural. Well, you believe me, don't you? Oh, now say you believe me. Who was my father? You don't know what you're asking. I can't tell you. Oh, yes, you can, if you want. I have a right to know, and you know I have that right. You can refuse to tell me if you please. But if you do, you'll see the last of me tomorrow morning. It's too horrible to hear you talk like this. You would... Oh, no, you couldn't leave me. Yes, without a moment's hesitation, if you trifle with me about this. How am I to know I don't have the contaminated blood of that brutal waster in my veins? Oh, no, no, on my oath, it's not he. You're only of the rest you've ever met. I'm certain of that, at least. You're certain of that, at least? Do you mean that's all you're certain of? I see. Oh, don't do that, Mother. 
You know you don't mean it a bit. Well, that's enough for this evening. What time do you like breakfast? It's half past eight too early for oh you. Oh, my God, what sort of a woman are you? One that the world is mostly made of, I should hope. Otherwise, I don't understand how he gets his business done. Now, come on. Pull yourself together. That's right. Oh. You're very rough with me, Vivi. Nonsense. Now, what about bed? It's past ten. Well, what's the use of my going to bed? You think I could sleep? Why not? I shall. Why, you! But you've no heart. But I won't bear it. I won't put up with the injustice of it. What right have you to set yourself up above me like this? You boast to what you are, to me. To me, that gave you the chance of being what you are. What chance had I? A shame on you. You're a bad daughter and you're a stuck-up prude. I never intended to set myself above you in any way. You wouldn't act me with the conventional authority of a mother. I defended myself with the conventional superiority of a respectable woman. Frankly, I'm not going to stand any more of your nonsense. And as soon as you drop it, I won't expect you to stand any of mine. I will always respect your right for your own opinions and your own way of life. For my own opinions and my own way of life. Listen to her talking. Do you think I was brought up like you? Able to pick and choose my own way of life? Do you think I did what I did because I liked it? Or thought it right? I wouldn't rather have gone to college and been a, a lady if I'd had the chance. Everybody has a choice, Mother. The poorest girl alive may not be able to choose between being Queen of England or Principal of Newnham, but she can choose between rag picking and flower selling according to her taste. People always blame their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the ones that go out and look for the right circumstances, and if they can't find them, make them. Oh, it's easy to talk, isn't it? Very easy. Here, would you like to know what my circumstances were? Yes, I think you'd better tell me. Won't you sit down? Oh, I'll sit down. Don't you be afraid. Do you know what your grandmother was? No. No, you don't. Well, I do. She called herself a widow and had a fried fish shop down by the mint and kept herself and four daughters out of it. Two of us were sisters. That was me and Liz, and we were both good-looking and well-made. I suppose our father was a well-fed man. Mother always pretended he was a gentleman, but I don't know. Now, the other two were only half-sisters. Undersized, ugly, starved-looking, hard-working, honest poor creatures. They were the respectable ones. Well, what did they get by their respectability? I'll tell you. One of them worked in a white lead factory 12 hours a day for nine shillings a week until she died of lead poisoning. She only expected to get her hands a little paralysed. But she died. Now, the other was always held up to us as a model because she married a government labourer in the depth of Fittling Yard and kept his room and three children neat and tidy on 18 shillings a week till he took to drink. Right, now, that was worth being respectable for, wasn't it? Did you and your sister think so? What oh, Liz didn't, I can tell you. She had more spirit. We both went to a church school, as that was part of the ladylike airs we gave ourselves to be superior to the children that went nowhere and knew nothing. And we stayed there till Liz went out one night and never came back. I know the schoolmistress thought I'd soon follow her example, for the clergyman was always telling me that Liz would end up by jumping off Waterloo Bridge. Oh, God, poor fool. All he knew about it. I was more afraid of the white lead factory than I was of the river. And so would you have been in my case. Now, that clergyman got me a situation as a scullery maid in a temperance restaurant where they sent out for anything you liked. And I was a waitress and I went to the bar at Waterloo Station 14 hours a day, serving drinks, washing glasses for four shillings a week and me board. Oh, now, that was considered a great promotion for me. And one cold, wretched night when I was so tired I could hardly keep myself awake, who should come in for half a scotch but Lizzie in a long fur cloak, elegant, comfortable, and with a lot of sovereigns in her purse? My Aunt Liz. Yes, and a very good aunt to have, too. She's living down at Winchester now, close to the cathedral, one of the most respectable ladies there. She chaperones the girls to the county ball, if you please. Ah, no river for Liz, thank you. You know, you remind me of Elizabeth. She was a first-rate businesswoman, saved money from the beginning and never let herself look, you know, too like what she was. Well, when she saw I'd grown up good-looking, she said to me across the bar, What are you doing there, you little fool? Wearing out your health and your appearance for other people's profit. 
Nasty. Liz was saving money then to take a place for herself in Brussels, and she thought that we two could save faster than one, so she left me some money, gave me a chance. I saved steadily. I first paid her back, and I went into business with her as her partner. Well, why shouldn't I have done it? Oh, that house in Brussels. Real high class. Much better place for a girl to be in than that factory where Anne Jane got poisoned. None of our girls was ever treated as I was treated in the scullery of that temperance place. Or the Waterloo Bar. Or at home. Would you have had me stay in them and become a worn-out old drudge before I was 40? No. But why choose that business? Surely good management and saving money will succeed in any business. Yes, saving money, but where's a woman to get the money to save in any other business? Well, could you save? Out of four shillings a week and keep yourself dressed as well. <laughs> Not you. Well, of course, if you're a plain woman and can't earn anything more, or if you've got a turn for music or the stage or newspaper writing, well, that's different. But neither Liz nor I had any turn for such things, as all we had was our appearance. Our turn for pleasing men. Do you think we were such fools as to let other people trade in our good looks by employing us as sales girls, waitresses, barmaids, when we could trade in them ourselves and get all the profits instead of starvation wages? Ah, <laughs> not likely. You were certainly quite justified from the business point of view. Well, or from any other point of view. What's any respectable girl brought up to do but catch some rich man's fancy and get the benefit of his money by marrying him? Well, as if a marriage ceremony could make any difference to the right or wrong of the thing. The hypocrisy of this world makes me sick. Liz and I are to work and save and calculate just like anyone else. Else wise, we'd be as poor as some drunken, good-for-nothing wastrel of a woman that thinks her luck will last forever. <laughs> I despise such people. They're no character. If there's anything I hate in a woman, it's want of character. But come now, Mother, frankly. Isn't it part of what you call good character in a woman that she should greatly dislike such a way of making a living? Oh, of course, dearie. But everybody dislikes having to work and make money. They have to do it just the same. I'm sure I've often pitied a poor girl, tired out, low spirits, having to try to please some man she doesn't care two straws for, some half-drunken fool. Thinks he's making himself agreeable when he's teasing and worrying and disgusting a woman so that hardly any money can pay her for putting up with it. But she has to bear with disagreeables. Make the rough with the smooth. Why, it's just like a nurse in a hospital or anyone else. It isn't work that any woman would do for pleasure, goodness knows. Though to hear the pious people talk, you'd suppose it was a bed of roses. Still, you consider it worthwhile. It pays. Hmm. Of course it's worthwhile for a poor girl. It's far better than any other employment open to her. Of course it's uh, not worthwhile for a lady. If you took to it, you'd be a fool. I'd have been a fool if I'd taken to anything else. But, Mother, suppose we were both as poor as you were in those wretched old days. Are you sure you wouldn't advise me to try the Waterloo Bar? Or marry a labourer. Or even go into a factory. But of course not. Look, what sort of a mother do you take me for? How could you keep your self-respect in such starvation and slavery? What's a woman worth? Well, what's life worth without self-respect? Why am I independent, able to give my daughter a first-rate education when other women with just as good opportunities are in the gutter? Because I knew how to respect myself and to control myself. Now, why is Liz looked up to in a cathedral town? What the same reason? Oh, now, don't you be led astray by people who don't know the world, my girl. The only way for a woman to provide decently for herself is to be good to some man that can afford to be good to her. And if she's in his own station of life, then let her make him marry her. But if she's far beneath him, she can't expect it. Well, why should she? Well, it wouldn't be for her own happiness. But you ask any lady in London society that has daughters and she'll tell you the same. Except I tell you straight and she'll tell you crooked. That's all the difference. Mother, you're a wonderful woman. And stronger than all England. And are you really and truly not one bit 
doubtful or or ashamed? Well, of course, dearie. But it's only good manners to be ashamed of it. It's expected from women. Well, women have to pretend to feel a good deal that they don't feel. <laughs> Liz used to be so angry with me for pumping out the truth about it, but... Ah, Liz was such a perfect lady. I was always a bit of a vulgarian. You know, I used to be so pleased when you sent me your photos to see that you were growing up like Liz. Just a ladylike, determined way. No. I was never a bit ashamed, really. And I consider I have the right to be proud of how we manage everything so respectably. Never had a word against us. Now, the girls were so well taken care of. Some of them did very well. One married an ambassador. Oh, now I dare not talk of such things. <laughs> what well, would they think of us? Oh! Ah! I believe I'm beginning to get sleepy after all. I believe it is I who will not sleep tonight. Better let some fresh air in before I lock up. Beautiful night. Look. Yes, dearie. Don't catch your death of cold from the night air. Oh, nonsense. <sighs> Ugh. You know, everything I say is nonsense, according to you. Oh, no, Mother, that's not so. You got completely the better of me tonight, though I meant it to be the other way. Now, let's be good friends. Ah, so it was the other way. Oh, well, I suppose I shall have to give in to it. I always got the worst of it from Liz, and I suppose it'll be the same with you. <laughs> well, never mind. Good night, dear old mother. I brought you up well, didn't I, dearie? You did. You'll be kind to your poor old mother for it, won't you? I will. Good night, dear. Oh. Blessings on my own dearly, darling. A mother's blessings. Just an old-fashioned lady with old-fashioned ways and a smile that says welcome to you. For the angels above taught her the way how to love to that old Fashioned mother of mine. We laughed at the comic and shouted encore and joined in the chorus how we used to roar. To boxes, to beans, and to rocks. To rocks and to beans and to boxes. I'd rather have a nice place to be with your boxes, to beans, and to rocks. Half past eleven. Nice hour for a rector to come down to breakfast. Don't mock, Frank. Don't mock. I'm a little, uh... Off colour. No, sir. Unwell this morning. Where's your mother? Don't be alarmed. She's not here. She's gone to town on 11.13. She left several messages for you. Do you feel equal to receiving them now, or shall I wait till you've breakfasted? I have breakfasted, sir. I'm surprised that your mother going to town when we have people staying with us. I'll think it very strange. Oh, possibly she's considered that. At all events, if Crofts is going to stay here and you are going to sit up every night until four, recalling the incidents of your fiery youth, it is clearly my mother's duty as a prudent housekeeper to go up to the stores and order a barrel of whiskey and a few hundred siphons. And did not observe that Sir George drank excessively? You were in no condition to, Governor. Do you mean to say that I... I never saw a beneficed clergyman less sober. The anecdotes you told about your past career were so awful that I really don't think Prade would have passed the night under your roof if it hadn't been for the way he and my mother took to one another. Nonsense. 
Well, I'm Sir George Cross, host. I must talk to him about something. There's only one subject. Where is Mr. Prade now? He's driving my mother and Bessie to the station. Is Crofts up yet? Oh, long ago. He hasn't turned a hair. Huh. He's in much better practice than you are. Kept it up ever since, probably. He's taken himself off somewhere to smoke. Frank. Yes? Do you think the Warrens will expect to be asked here after yesterday afternoon? They've been asked already. Oh. What? Crofts informed us at breakfast that you told him to bring Vivian and Mrs. Warren over here today and to invite them to make this house their home. My mother then found she had to go to town by the 11.13 train. I never gave any such invitation. I never thought of such a thing. How do you know, Governor? What you said and thought last night? Good morning. Good morning. I must apologise for not having met you at breakfast. I have a touch of... Uh... Clergyman's sore throat, Fred. It's fortunately not chronic. Oh, I must say, your house is in the most charming spot here, really most charming. Yes. Yes, it is indeed. Frank, we'll take you for a walk, Mr. Prade, if you like. I'll ask you to excuse me. <laughs> Let's take the opportunity to write my sermon while Mrs. Gardner's away and you're all amusing yourselves. <laughs> you won't mind? Certainly not. Don't stand on the slightest ceremony with me. Thank you. I'll... Curious thing it must be, writing a sermon every week. Hmm, ever so curious. If he did it, he buys them. <laughs> He's gone for some soda water. Oh, my dear boy, I do wish you'd show more respect to your father. You know, you can be quite nice when you like. My dear Paddy, you forget I have to live with a governor. When two people live together, it don't matter whether they're father and son, husband and wife, brother and sister. They can't keep up the polite humbug that's so easy for ten minutes of an afternoon call. Now, the Governor, who unites to many admirable domestic qualities the irresoluteness of a sheep and the pompousness and aggressiveness of a jackass... Oh, now, now, pray remember, Frank, he's your father. Oh, I give him due credit for that. But just imagine him telling Crofts to bring the Warrens over here today. He must have been ever so drunk. You know, my dear Praddy, my mother simply wouldn't put up with Mrs. Warren for a moment. But he mustn't come here till she's gone back to town. Your mother doesn't know anything about Mrs. Warren, does she? I don't know. Journey to town, rather, looks as if she did. Oh, not that my mother would mind in the ordinary way. I mean, she's stuck like a brick to lots of women who've got into trouble. But they're all nice women. <laughs> That's what makes a real difference. Mrs. Warren, no doubt, has her merits, but she's ever so rowdy and my mother simply wouldn't put up with her. Hello. Frank! Mrs. Warren and her daughter are coming across the heath with crops. I saw them from the study windows. What am I to say about your mother? Stick on your hat, go out and say how delighted you are to see them. Tell them that Frank is in the garden, that Mother and Bessie have been called to the bedside of a sick relative and were ever so sorry they couldn't stop, uh, that, that you hope Mrs. Warren slept well, and... Uh, well, oh, tell them any blessed thing except the truth and leave the rest of Providence. How are we to get rid of them afterwards? Oh, there's no time to think of that now. He's so impetuous. I don't know what to do with him, Mr. Prey. Now, off you go. Pray to you while I wait, wait here. Keep the whole thing in unpremeditated air. Oh. oh, we must get the old girl back to town somehow, Pray. Come honestly, dear Praddy, do you like seeing her and Vivi together? Oh, why not? Well, don't you make your flesh creep over us a little? That wicked old devil up to every villainy under the... Shh. Oh, my dear Mrs. Warren, how delightful to see you. This quiet old rectory garden becomes you perfectly. Oh, I never hear that, George. Says I look well in a quiet old rectory garden. You look well everywhere, Mrs. Warren. Bravo, Governor. Now, let's have a treat before lunch. First, let's see the church. Everyone has to do that. It's a regular old 13th century church, you know, and the governor's ever so fond of it, because he got up a restoration fund and had it completely rebuilt six years ago. Praddy will be able to show its points. Certainly, if the restoration has left any to show. I should be pleased, I'm sure, if Sir George and Mrs. Warren really care about it. Uh, this way, through the lich gate and across the fields. Come on, get it over. Well, I've no objection. Now, Mrs. Can you lead the way? It looks a very mushy sort of path. Yes, I'm Where? Ain't you coming? No. I want to give you a warning, Frank. You were making fun of my mother just now when you said that about the rectory garden. That's barred in future. 
You will treat my mother with the same respect you treat your own. My dear Viv, she wouldn't appreciate it. The two cases require different treatment. Hey, what on earth has happened to you? Last night we were perfectly agreed as to your mother and her set. And this morning I find you attitudinizing sentimentally with your arm around your parents' waist. Attitudinizing? That was how it struck me. That is the first time I ever saw you do a second-rate thing. Yes, Frank, there has been a change. But I don't think it a change for the worse. Yesterday I was a little prig. And today? Today? I know my mother much better than you do. Oh, God forbid. What do you mean? Viv. There is a Freemasonry among thoroughly immoral people that you know nothing of. You've too much character. That's the bond between your mother and me. That is why I know her better than you'll ever know. You're wrong. You know nothing about my mother. If you knew the circumstances against which she had to struggle, you should, I should know, know why, why she, she is, is what... what she is, shouldn't I? Oh, what difference would that make? Circumstances or no circumstances, Viv, you're not going to be able to stand your mother. Why not? Because she's an old wretch, Viv. And if you ever put your arm around your parents' waist in my presence again, I will shoot myself there and then as a protest against an exhibition which revolts me. And am I to choose between dropping your acquaintance and dropping that of my mother's? Mm, no. No, that would put the old lady at ever such a disadvantage. No, your infatuated little boy is going to have to stick to you in any case. But he's all the more anxious that you shouldn't make mistakes. It's no use, Viv. Your mother's impossible. She may be a good sort, but she's a bad lot. She's a very bad lot. Frank! And is she to be deserted by the whole world because she's what you call a bad lot? Has she no right to live? Oh, there's no fear of that, Viv. She won't ever be deserted. But I am to desert her, Mustn't I suppose. Mustn't go live with her. Little family group of mother and daughter. It wouldn't be a success. It'd spoil our little group. What little group? Babes in the wood. Vivi. Little Frank. Let's get covered up with leaves. <clears throat> hand in hand, fast asleep under the trees. Oh, dear little girl and a silly little boy. A dear little boy and his dowdy little girl. Ever so peaceful and relieved from the imbecility of the little boy's father and the questionableness of the little girl's. Little girl wants to forget all about her mother. <clears throat> Gracious, what a pair of fools we are. Look at your hair. I wonder, do all grown-up people behave in this childish way when no-one's looking? I'm sure I never did when I was a child. Neither did I. You're my first playmate. <laughs> oh, damn. Could I have a few words with you, Miss Vivian? Certainly. You'll excuse me, Gardner. They're waiting for you in the church, if you don't mind. Certainly, Crofts. Anything to oblige you, except church. If you should want me for anything, Vivens, ring the gate bell. A pleasant young fellow, that, Miss Vivian. It's a pity he has no money, isn't it? Do you think so, Sir George? Well, he wants you to do. I mean, no profession, no property. I mean, what's he good for? I realise his disadvantages. Oh, it's not that. But while we're in this world, we're in it, and uh, money is money. <laughs> nice day, isn't it? Very. <laughs> well, that's not what I came to say. Uh, now, listen, Miss Vivi. I'm, I'm quite aware that I'm not a young lady's man. Indeed, Sir George. No. And to be perfectly honest, I don't want to be either. But um, when I say a thing, I mean it. When I feel a sentiment, I feel it in earnest. And what I value, I pay hard money for. I mean, that's the sort of man I am. It does you great credit, I'm sure. Oh, I don't mean to praise myself. I mean, I have my faults, heaven knows. I mean, no man's more sensible than that than I am. I mean, I know I'm not perfect. But that's one of the advantages of being a middle-aged man, you see. But I'm not a young man, and I know it. 
But uh, my code is a simple one and I think a good one. Honour between man and man, fidelity between man and woman, and uh, no cant about this religion or that religion, but an honest belief that things are making for good on the whole. A power not ourselves that makes for righteousness, eh? Oh, yes, certainly. I mean, not ourselves. Of course. Well, I mean, you understand what I mean. Well, now, um, as to practical matters, you may have an idea that I've flung my money about, but I haven't. I'm richer today than when I first came into the property. I've used my knowledge of the world to invest my money in ways that other men have overlooked. So, um, whatever else I may be, I'm a safe man from the money point of view. Hmm? It's very good of you to tell me all this, Sir George. Well, well come, Miss Vivi, you needn't pretend you don't see what I'm driving at. And I want to settle down with the Lady Crofts. I suppose you think me very blunt. Hmm? Oh, not at all. I thank you for being so definite and business-like about it all. And I very much appreciate the offer. Mm -hmm. The money, the position, Lady Crofts and so on. But I think I'll say no, if you don't mind. I'd rather not. No, I mean no hurry. I mean, this is just to let you know in case young Gardner should try and trap you. We'll leave the question open, hmm? My no is final. I won't go back on it. I'm a good deal older than you. Twenty-five years. A quarter of a century. I shan't live forever. I'll take care that you're well off when I'm gone. Oh, I'm proof even against that inducement, Sir George. Don't you think you'd better take your answer? There's no chance of me changing it. Well, no matter. I could tell you some things that would change your mind fast enough, but uh, I won't. But I'd rather win you by honest affection. I was a good friend of your mother's. You ask her whether I wasn't. And she'd never have made the money to pay for your education if it hadn't been for my advice and help. I mean, not to mention the money I advanced her. No, there's not many men that would have uh, stood by her like I have. I put no less than oh, 40,000 pounds into it from first to last. Do you mean to say you were my mother's business partner? Yes. Now, just think of all the trouble and the explanations it would save if we were to keep the whole thing in the family, so to speak. Hmm? When you ask your mother whether she'd like to have to explain all her affairs to a perfect stranger... Oh, I see no difficulty there. Because I understand that the business is wound up and the money invested. Wound up? Wind up a business that's paying 35% in the worst years? Not likely. <laughs> Who told you that? Do you mean that it's still... What business are you talking about? Well, the fact is, it's not what would be considered exactly a high-class business in my set. I mean, that's the county set, you know. Well, our set it'll be, if you think better of my offer. Well, not that there's anything mysterious about it. I mean, don't think that. Well, of course, you know, by your mother's being in it, it's perfectly straight and honest. I've known her for many years, and I can say of her she'd cut off her hand sooner than touch anything that wasn't what it ought to be. Well, I'll tell you all about it, if you like. I don't know whether you've ever found in travelling how hard it is to find a really comfortable private hotel. Yes. Go on. Well, um, that's all it is. I mean, your mother has a genius for managing such things. We've got two in Ostend, one in Brussels, one in Vienna, and uh, two in Budapest. Of course, there are others besides ourselves in it, but we hold most of the capital. And your mother's invaluable as managing director. I mean, you've noticed, I dare say, she travels a good deal. But you see, you can't mention such things in society. He once let out the word hotel, and everybody thinks you're keeping a public house. <laughs> well, you wouldn't like people to say that of your mother, would you? I mean, that's why we've been so reserved about it. By the way, you'll keep it yourself, won't you? I, since it's been a secret so long, it had better remain so. 
And this is the business you invite me to join you in? Oh, no. My wife shan't be troubled with business. You'll not be in it more than you've always been. I always been? What do you mean? Well, only that you've always lived on it. I mean, it paid for your education and the dress you have on your back. <laughs> oh, don't you turn up your nose at business, Miss Vivi. Where would your Newnams and your Girtons be without it? Take care. I know what this business is. Who told you? Your partner. My mother. Why, the old... Just so. Well, she ought to have had more consideration for you. I mean, I'd never have told you. I think you would have done when we were married. It would have been a convenient weapon to break me in with. Now, I never intended that. Now, on my word, as a gentleman, I didn't. It wouldn't matter if you did. I hope you understand that after this afternoon, our acquaintance ceases. But why? Is it for helping your mother? My mother was a poor woman who had no reasonable choice. You were a rich gentleman who did the same thing for the sake of 35%. I think you're a pretty common sort of scoundrel. <laughs> That's my opinion of you. Yeah, go it, little missy, go it. <laughs> it does me no harm and it amuses you. Why the devil shouldn't I invest my money that way? I take the interest on my capital like other people. Well, I hope you don't think I've dirty my own hands with the work. Oh, come. You wouldn't refuse the acquaintance of my mother's cousin, the Duke of Belgravia, because some of the rents he gets are earned in queer ways. But I mean, you wouldn't cut the Archbishop of Canterbury, I suppose, because the ecclesiastical commissioners are some publicans and sinners amongst their tenants. <laughs> Do you remember your Croft scholarship at Newnham? Well, that was founded by my brother, the MP. Now, he gets his 22% out of a factory with over 600 girls in it and not one of them earning enough money to live on. How do you suppose they manage when they've no family to fall back on? Well, ask your mother. <coughs> do you expect me to turn my back on 35% when everyone else is pocketing what they can like sensible men? I mean, no such fool. If you're going to pick and choose your acquaintances on moral principles, you better get clear out of this country. Unless you want to cut yourself out of all decent society. And you might go on to point out that I never asked where the money I spent came from. I believe I'm as bad as you. Well, of course you are. And a very good thing, too. I mean, what harm does it do, after all? Hmm? <sighs> so, you don't think me such a scoundrel now you come to think it over? Hmm? I've shared profits with you. I've admitted you just now to the familiarity of letting you know what I think of you. To be sure you did. And you won't find me such a bad sort. I mean, I don't go in for being super fine intellectually, but I've got plenty of honest human feeling. And the old Crofts breed comes out in a sort of instinctive hatred of anything low. In which I'm sure you'll sympathise with me. <laughs> oh, believe me, Miss Vivi, the world isn't such a bad place as the croakers make out. I mean, provided you don't fly openly in the face of society, society doesn't ask any awkward questions. And it makes precious short work of the cads who do. Now, there's no secrets better kept than the secrets everybody guesses. You see, in the class of people I can introduce you to, no lady or gentleman would so far forget themselves as to discuss my business affairs or your mother's. No one can offer you a safer position. I suppose you think you're getting on famously with me, don't you? Well, I uh, flatter myself you think better of me now than you first did. Yeah. I hardly think you're worth thinking about. When I think about the society that tolerates you, the laws that protect you, how helpless nine out of ten girls would be in the hands of my mother, that unmentionable woman and her capitalist bully. Damn you! You need not. I feel among the damned already. Do you think I'm going to put up with that from you, you young devil? Leave me alone. Someone will 
Will you have the rifle, Viv, or shall I operate? Frank, were you listening? Only for the gate bell, I assure you. So you wouldn't have to wait. I think I showed great insight into your character, Croft. For two pins, I'd take that gun away from you and crack it across your head. Pray don't. I'm ever so careless in handling firearms. There's sure to be a fatal accident with a reprimand from the coroner's jury for my negligence. Put the gun down, Frank. It's not necessary. Uh, quite right, Viv. Much more sportsmanlike to catch him in a trap. Mm. Crofts, there are 15 cartridges in this magazine, and I'm a dead shot at the present distance and at an object of your size. Oh, don't be afraid. I'm not going to touch you. It's <coughs> ever so magnanimous of you under the circumstances. Thank you. I'll just tell you this before I go. It may interest you, since you're so fond of each other. Mr. Frank, may I introduce you to your half-sister, the eldest daughter of the Reverend Samuel Gardner? Miss Vivian, your half-brother. Good morning. You'll testify before the jury that it was an accident, won't you, Viv? Shoot now, you may! Viv! You gave me ever such a turn! Suppose it had gone off! Supposing it had, don't you think it would have been a relief to have some sharp physical pain going through me? Take it ever so easy, Viv. Remember, even if the rifle scared that fellow into telling the truth for the first time in his life, It only makes us a babes in the wood in earnest. Come and be covered up with leaves. Oh, no, not that. Anything but that. It makes my flesh creep. Why, what's the matter? Goodbye. Viv, where are you going? Where shall we find you? At Noria Fraser's. 67 Chancery Lane. For the rest of my life. Viv! Viv, wait! attend to your business. I've been exactly 20 minutes for a cup of tea. How did you get in? Staff hadn't left when I arrived. He's gone to play cricket on Primrose Hill. Why didn't you employ a woman? Give your sex a chance. What have you come for? Let's enjoy the half holiday somewhere like the staff. What do you say to Richmond and then a music hall and a jolly supper? I can't afford it. Oh! I'll put in six hours work before I go to bed. Can't afford it, can't we? Look, Vivums. Gold, Vivums. Gold. Where did you get it? Gambling, Viv. Gambling poker. It's meaner than stealing. No, I'm not coming. Oh, but Viv, I want to talk to you ever so seriously. All right. You can sit in Honoria's chair and talk here. I like ten minutes chat after tea. Oh. No use groaning. I'm inexorable. Pass the cigar box, will you? Nasty womanly habit. Nice men don't do it any longer. I know. They object to the smell in the office. We've had to take to cigarettes. Look. Go ahead. Well, I want to know what you've done, what arrangements you've made. Everything was arranged 20 minutes after I arrived. Honoria had found the business far too much for her this year, and she's on the point of sending for me and proposing a partnership when I walked in the door and told her I hadn't a farthing to my name. So I installed myself and sent her off for two weeks' holiday. What happened in Hazelmere when I left? Nothing at all. I told him you'd come to town on particular business. Well? Well, either they were too flabbergasted to say anything or else Crofts had prepared your mother. Anyway, she didn't say anything. Crofts didn't say anything. And Praddy only stared. After tea, they got up and went. I haven't seen them since. 
Well, that's all right. Do you intend to stick in this confounded place? Yes. These last two days have given me back all my strength and self-possession. I'll never take a holiday again as long as I live. Phew. You look quite happy and as hard as nails. Well for me that I am. Look, Viv, we must have an explanation. We parted the other day under a complete misunderstanding. All right. <sighs> Clear it up. You remember what Crofts told us? Yes. Well, that revelation was supposed to bring about a complete change in the nature of our feelings for one another. Uh, it, it places on the footing of brother and sister. Yes. Uh, have you ever had a brother? No. No, no. Well, I have lots of sisters, so the fraternal feeling is quite familiar to me. And I assure you that my feeling for you is not the least in the world like it. Girls will go their way, I'll go mine. We shan't care if we never see one another again, but... As to you, I can't be easy if I have to pass a week without seeing you. That's not brother and sister. It's exactly what I felt an hour before Crofts made his revelation. In short, dear Viv, it's love's young dream. The same feeling, Frank, that brought your father to my mother's feet. Is that it? I very strongly object to having my feelings compared to any that the Reverend Samuel is capable of harboring. And I object still more of any comparison of you to your mother. Besides, I don't believe the story. I taxed my father with it and I obtained from him what I consider tantamount to a denial. What did he say? He said he's sure there must be some mistake. And you believe him? <laughs> well, I'll take his word as against Crofts. Well, does it make any real difference in your imagination or conscience? For, in fact, it makes no real difference. None whatever to me. Nor to me. Oh, this is ever so surprising. I thought our whole relations were altered in your imagination and conscience, as you put it, the moment those words were out of that brute's muzzle. Not at all. I didn't believe him. I only wish I could. Hey. I think brother and sister would be a very suitable relationship for us. Do you really mean that? It's the only relationship I care for, even if we could afford another. I mean that. Huh. Dear Viv, why didn't you say so before? Ever so sorry for persecuting you. I understand, of course. Understand what? Oh, I'm not a fool in the ordinary sense. Only in the scriptural sense of doing all the things a wise man declared to be folly, after trying them himself on the most extensive scale. I see I am no longer my Vivum's little boy. Don't be alarmed. I shan't ever call you Vivums again. At least until you get tired of your new little boy, whoever he may be. My new little boy? Hmm. Must be a new little boy. Always happens that way. No other way, in fact. No other way that you know of, fortunately for you. Oh, my curse upon yon caller, where he be. Oh, it's prayed. He's going to Italy this afternoon and asked if he could call. Go and let him in. We can continue our conversation after his departure for Italy. I am going to stay him out. Oh, my dear Pratty. Thank you, boy. How pleasant. Delighted to see you. Do go in. How do you do, my dear Miss Warren? I start in an hour from Hoban Viaduct. I wish I could persuade you to try Italy. What for? Why? To saturate yourself with beauty and romance, of course. It's no use, Pratty. Vivi is a little philistine. She is indifferent to my romance and insensible to me beauty. Mr. Prade, once and for all, there is no beauty and romance in life for me. Life is what it is, and I'm prepared to meet it as it is. You would not say that if you came with me to Verona and on to Venice. You would cry with delight at living in such a beautiful world. Oh, this is ever so eloquent, Praddy. Keep it up. Oh, I assure you. I have cried. I shall cry again, I hope, at 50. And your age, Miss Warren, you would not even need to go as far as Verona. Your spirits would absolutely fly up at the mere sight of Ostend. You would be charmed with the happy air, the gaiety, the vivacity of Brussels. Oh! What's the matter? Hello. Can you find no better example of your beauty and romance than Brussels to talk to me about? Well, of course, it's very different from Verona. I don't suggest... Probably the beauty moment, and romance but... come to much the same in both places. Oh, my dear Miss Warren, I... Is anything the matter? Mm. She thinks your enthusiasm frivolous, Praddy. She's had ever such a serious call. Oh, hold your tongue, Frank. Don't be so silly. 
I say, pray, do call his good manners. Shall I take him away, Miss Warren? I feel sure we have disturbed you at your work. Sit down. I'm not ready to start work yet. Now, you both think I've had an attack of nerves. Not a bit of it. But there are two subjects I would like dropped, if you don't mind. One is love's young dream in any shape or form. And the other is the beauty and romance of life, especially Ostend and the gaiety of Brussels. You're welcome to any illusions you have left on the subjects I have none. Now, if we three are to remain friends, I must be thought of as a woman of business, permanently single and permanently unromantic. I shall also remain permanently single until you change your mind. Praddy, change the subject. Be eloquent about something else. I'm afraid there's nothing else in the world I can talk about. The gospel of arts is the only one I can preach. I know Miss Warren is a great devotee of the gospel of getting on, but we can't discuss that without hurting your feelings, Frank, since you are determined not to get on. <laughs> Don't mind my feelings. Give me some improving advice by all means. It does me ever so much good. Come on, Viv. Let's have it all. Try and make it a successful man of me. Energy, thrift, foresight, self-respect, character. Don't you hate people who have no character? Viv? Oh, stop, stop. Let's have no more of that horrible cant. Mr. Prade, if there really are only those two Gospels left, then we may as well all kill ourselves. For the same taint is in both, through and through. There is a touch of poetry about you today, Viv, which has hitherto been lacking. My dear Frank, aren't you a little unsympathetic? No, it's good for me. It stops me from being sentimental. Checks your strong natural propensity that way, don't it? Oh, yes, go on. Don't spare me. I was sentimental for one moment in my life, beautifully sentimental, by moonlight and now... Viv, do take care. Don't give yourself away. Don't you think Mr. Prey doesn't know all about my mother? You should have told me that morning, Mr. Prey. You're rather old-fashioned in your delicacies, after all. Surely. It is you who are being a little old-fashioned in your prejudices, Miss Warren. I feel bound to tell you, speaking as an artist, and believing that the most intimate human relationships are far beyond and above the scope of the law, that though I know your mother was an unmarried woman, I do not respect her the less on that account. I respect her more. Here, here. Is that all you know? Certainly it is all. Then you know nothing. Your guesses are innocence itself compared to the truth. I hope not. I hope not, Miss Warren. You're not making it easy for me to tell you, Mr. Prade. If there is anything worse, that is, anything else, are you sure you are right to tell us, Miss I Warren? feel sure that if I had the strength, I would spend the rest of my life in telling everybody and stamping and branding it into them till they felt their part in the abomination as I feel mine. There's nothing I despise more than the wicked convention that protects these things by forbidding women to mention them. And yet I cannot tell you. The two words that describe what my mother is are ringing in my ears and struggling on my tongue, yet I cannot utter them. The shame of them is too much for me. Come, let me draft your prospectus. You shall see. Paid up capital, not less than 40,000. Oh, she's Standing mad. in the name of Sir George Crofts, Baronet. Premises in Brussels. Do you hear, Viv? Mad. Ostend. Pull yourself together. Vienna and Budapest. Managing Director, Mrs. Warren. And now let's not forget the two words, her qualifications. It's all right, Viv. 
I read what you wrote. So did Braddy. We understand. And we remain, as this leaves us at present, yours ever so devotedly. We do indeed, Miss Warren. I declare, you are the most splendidly courageous woman I ever met. Take it easy, Viv. Thanks. I don't stir if you don't want to. You can always depend on me for two things. Not to cry and not to faint. I'll need much more courage than that when I tell my mother we've come to the parting of the ways. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll just go and make myself neat again. Shall we go away? No, it's all right. I won't be a moment. What an amazing revelation. <clears throat> I'm extremely disappointed in Crofts. I am indeed. Hmm? I'm not in the least. I feel he's perfectly accounted for at last. Ooh. What a facer for me, Braddy. I can't marry her now. Frank! Let me tell you, Gardner, if you desert her now, you will behave very despicably. <laughs> Good old Braddy. Ever chivalrous. But you mistake. It's not the moral aspect, it's the money aspect. I can't possibly touch the old woman's money now. And was that what you were going to marry on? Well, what else? I haven't got any. What a smallest turn for making it. If I married Viv now, she'd have to support me. And I think I'd cost her more than I'm worth. But surely a clever fellow like you can make something with your own brains? Oh, yes, a little. Made all this yesterday in an hour and a half. But I made it in a highly speculative business. No, even if Georgina and Bessie marry millionaires and the governor dies after cutting them off with a shilling, I shall still only have 400 a year. And he won't die till he's three score and ten. He hasn't originality enough. Oh, I shall be on short allowance for the next 20 years. No short allowance for Viv, if I can help it. No. I leave the field to the gilded youth of England. So that's settled. I won't worry her about it. I'll just write her a little note. She'll understand. Good fellow, Frank. I heartily beg your pardon. But must you never see her again? Never see her again? Oh, hang it all. Do be reasonable. I shall come along as often as possible and be a brother. I can never understand the absurd consequences you romantic people expect from the most ordinary transactions. Hello. Oh, I wonder who that is. Braddy, would you mind answering the door? If it's a client, it'll look more respectable. Certainly. My dear Kitty, come in, come in. What? You're here, are you? Here and charmed to see you. You come like a breath of spring. Oh, get out with your nonsense. Where's Vivi? Praddy, won't she see me, don't you think? My dear Kitty, don't distress yourself. Why should she not? Oh, you never can see why not. You're too innocent. Mr. Frank, did she say anything to you? She must see you, if you wait till she comes in. Why shouldn't I wait? Mrs. Warren, suppose you were a sparrow. Ever so pretty and tiny a sparrow hopping in the roadway, and you saw a steamroller coming towards you. Would you wait for it? Oh, don't bother me with your sparrows. What did she run away from Hazelmere like that for? I'm afraid she'll tell you if you rashly await her return. You want me to go away? No. I always want you to stay. But I advise you to go. Well, never see her again? Precisely. Oh, Paddy, don't let him be cruel to me. God, she'll be so angry with me if she sees I've been crying. Mrs. Warren, you know that Paddy is a soul of kindness. Paddy, what do you say? Go or stay? I really should be extremely sorry to cause you any unnecessary pain, but I think perhaps you'd better not wait. The fact is... Ah! Really... Too late. Don't tell her I was crying. Well, dearie. Here you are at last. I'm glad you've come. I wanted to speak to you. Frank, I think you said you were going. Yes. Mrs. Warren, would you like to come with me? What do you say to Richmond and then a trip to the theatre? There's safety in Richmond, no steamroller there. Don't be silly, Frank. My mother will stay here. 
I, I, I don't know. Uh, perhaps I'd better go. Yes. We're disturbing you at your work. Sit down, Mother. Mr. Prade, will you take Frank with you? Come, Frank. Goodbye, Miss Warren. Goodbye and a pleasant trip. Thank you, thank you. I hope so, I hope so. Goodbye, Mrs. Warren. You'd ever so much better have taken my advice. Bye-bye, Bruce. Goodbye. Goodbye, Kitty. Bye-bye, Freddy. Bibby, what did you go away like that for? And without saying a word to me, how could you do such a thing? And what have you done to poor George? I wanted him to come with me, but he shuffled out of it, and I could see that he was quite afraid of you. <laughs> and be fancy, he wanted me not to come. Well, as if I should be afraid of you, dearie. Well, of course, I told him it was all comfortable and settled between us and that we were on the best of terms. Vivi, what's the meaning of this? Well, I got it from the bank this morning. It's my monthly allowance. It was sent to me as usual. I sent it back to be credited to your account and asked them to send you a lodgement receipt. In future, I shall support myself. Well, wasn't it enough? Well, why didn't you tell me? Oh, I'll double it. Oh, well, I was intending to double it, only let me know how much you want. You know you that want. that has nothing to do with it. From this time on, I go my own way, in my own business, among my own friends. And you will go yours. Goodbye. Goodbye? Yes, goodbye. Now, don't pretend you don't understand. Let's not have a useless scene. Sir George Crofts has explained the whole business to me. Ah, oh, that's silly old... Just so. You ought to have his tongue cut out. Yeah, but I thought it was ended. Well, you said you didn't mind. Excuse me, I do mind. Yeah, I explained. You explained how it came about. You did not tell me it was still going on. Vivi. You know how rich I am. I've no doubt you're very rich. Yes, but you don't what... You don't know what all that means. You're too young. It means a new dress every day. It means theatres and parties every night. It means having the pick of all the gentlemen in Europe at your feet. It means a, a lovely house and plenty of servants. It means the choicest of eating and drinking. It means everything you like, everything you want, everything you can think of. And what are you here? You're a mere drudge toiling and moiling early to late for a bear living and two cheap dresses a year. Now, you think it over. Hmm. You're shocked. I know. Well, I can enter into your feelings. I think they do you credit. But you trust me. You see, no one will blame you. You can take my word for that. Oh, I know what young girls are. I know you'll think better of it when you've turned it over in your mind. So that's how it's done, is it, Mother? You must have said that to many a young woman, to have it off so pat. What harm am I asking you to do? Oh, Vivi, listen to me. You don't understand. Now, you've been taught wrong on purpose. You don't know what the world is really like. Taught wrong on purpose? What do you mean? I mean, you're throwing away all your chances for nothing. You think that people are what they pretend to be, that the way you were taught at school to think right and proper is the way things really are, but it's not. It's only a pretense to keep the cowardly, slavish, common runner people quiet. Oh, Vivi, the big people, the clever people, the, the managing people, they all know it. They do as I do. They think as I think. I know plenty of them. I know them to speak to, to introduce you to, and to make friends of for you. No, I don't mean anything wrong. You see, that's what you don't understand. Your head's full of ignorant ideas about me. Look, what are the people that ever taught you know about life? All about people like me. When did they ever meet me, speak to me? Or let anyone ever tell them about me, the fools. Would they ever have done anything if I hadn't paid them? Now, haven't I told you I want you to be respectable? Haven't I brought you up to be respectable? Well, how can you keep it up without my money, my influence and Lizzie's friends? Can't you see? You're cutting your own throat as well as breaking my heart and turning your back on me. I recognise the Crofts' philosophy of life, Mother. I had it all from him that day of the gardeners. Oh, 
you think I want to force that played out old sot on you? I don't, Vivi. Now, on my oath, I don't. It wouldn't matter if you did. You wouldn't succeed. Mother, you don't know at all the kind of woman I am. I don't object to the Crofts of this world more than I do to any other coarsely built man of his class. To tell you the truth, I rather admire him for being strong-minded enough to enjoy himself in his own way and make plenty of money, instead of leading the usual hunting, shooting, tailoring, dining out life of his set, merely because all the rest do it. And I'm perfectly aware that I've been brought up in the same circumstances as Liz and I've done exactly what she did. I don't think I'm any more prejudiced or straight-laced than you are. I think I'm less, I'm certainly less sentimental. I realise that fashionable morality is a mere pretense. And that if I took your money and spent the rest of my life in spending it fashionably, I could be as worthless and vicious as any girl could wish to be and not have a word said to me about it. But I don't want to be worthless. I wouldn't enjoy trotting round the park to advertise my dressmaker and my carriage builder or being bored at the op opera to show off a shop window full of diamonds. Yeah, Wait a bit, I haven't finished. Why do you continue in a business now that you're independent of it? Your sister, you told me, has left that all behind her. Why don't you do the same? Well, well, it's all very easy for Liz. Look, she likes high society, and she has the air of being a lady. You've got to imagine me in a cathedral town where the very rooks and the trees would find me out, even if I could stand the dullness of it. I must have work and excitement, or I shall go melancholy mad. Yeah, and what else is there for me to do? The life suits me. I'm fit for it, not for anything else. And if I didn't do it, somebody else would. So I don't do any real harm by it. Yeah, and then it brings in money. I like making money. No. It's no good. I can't give it up. Not for anyone. Oh, but what need you know about it? Because I'll never mention it. I keep Crofts away. I'll not trouble you much. I'm constantly running about from one place to another. Look, you'll be quit of me altogether when I die. I'm my mother's daughter. I'm like you. I must work and I must make more money than I spend. But my work is not your work and my way not your way. We must part. It won't make any real difference. Instead of meeting for a few months in 20 years, we'll never meet. That's all. I meant to be more with you, Vivi. I did indeed. It's no use, Mother. I won't be changed by a few cheap tears and entreaties any more than you would, I dare say. You call a mother's tears cheap? They cost you nothing! And you ask me to give up the peace and quietness of my whole life in exchange. What use would my company be to you if you could get it? What if we two in common that could make either of us happy together? We're mother and daughter, and I want my daughter. I have a right to you. Who's to care for me when I'm old? Many girls have taken to me like daughters and cried at leaving me, but I let them all go because I had you to look forward to. I kept myself lonely for you. You've no right to turn your back on me now and refuse to do your duty as a daughter. My duty as a daughter. I thought we'd come to that. Now, once and for all, Mother, you want a daughter and Frank wants a wife. I don't want a mother and I don't want a husband. I've spared neither Frank nor myself in sending him about his business. Do you think I should spare you? I know the sort you are. You've no mercy for yourself or anyone else I know. Experience has done that for me. I can tell the callous, pious, hard, selfish woman when I see her. Well, keep yourself to yourself. I don't want you. But you listen to this. Do you know what I would do with you if you were a baby again? I assured us there's a heaven above us. Strangle me, perhaps. No, I'd bring you up to be a real daughter to me, not what you are now with your pride and your prejudice and your college education that you stole from me. Yes, stole. Now you deny it if you can. What was it but stealing? I'd bring you up in my own house, I would. In one of your own houses? Oh, listen to her! Listen to how she spits on her mother's grey hairs! May you live to have your own daughter tear and trample on you as you've trampled on me! 
And you will. You will. No woman ever had luck with her mother's curse on her. I wish you wouldn't rant, Mother. It only hardens me. Now, come. I suppose I'm the only young woman you've had in your power you've done good to. Don't spoil it now. Yes, if you forgive me, it's true, and you're the only one that's ever turned on me. Oh, the injustice, Mother, the injustice. I always wanted to be a good woman. I tried honest work. I, I was slave driven until I cursed the day I ever heard of honest work. I was a good mother. And because I made my daughter a good woman, she turns me out as if I was a leper. Oh, if only I had my life to live over again, I'd talk to that lying clergyman at the school. From this time forth, so help me heaven in my last hour, I'll do wrong. Nothing but wrong. And I'll prosper on it. Yes. It's better to choose your line and go through with it. And if I'd been you, I'd probably done exactly what you did. But I wouldn't have chosen one life and believed in another. You're a conventional woman at heart, Mother. And that's why I'm bidding you goodbye. I'm right, am I not? Right to throw away all my money? No, right to get rid of you. I'd be a fool not to, isn't that so? Yes. If it comes to that, I suppose you are. But Lord help the world if everyone took to doing the right thing. Oh, I'd better go. Rather than stay where I'm not wanted. Won't you shake hands? No. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. And goodbye.